Let me introduce myself as Dr. V. Ramesh. I'm a professor and head of uh, dermatology at Vardhaman Mahavir Medical College, which is attached to Safarjang Hospital. And I'm also the president of the Dermatopathology Society of India. Currently, we are embarking on the Dermatopathology lecture series, looking at the interest generated both by pathologists and dermatologists in getting to know this little specialty, a subspecialty which is emerging in its own way in order to improve both our practice, our knowledge and to better the lives of most of the patients who seek advice for various types of skin disorders. To start with, we all face many types of dermatosis due to varying conditions and causes. But the most common cause which all of us face is due to infections. So these infections which we see in the, in the skin are naturally the common ones. But, but since most of these have a presentation which may or may not be typical, it is important for us also to look into the pathology of these conditions to have a better firm understanding of how they present and what their picture could be in order to deliver the best possible care to the patients who seek our advice. So the most common infections in this country by far are the mycobacterial and fungal infections and other parasitic dermatoses. Among the mycobacterial infections, leprosy and tuberculosis occupy the highest care and most of us are in our day-to-day -day practice come across these conditions in some way or the other. Following this, we also come across fungal, uh, fungal infections, the commonest of which for which histopathology is definitely required is deep mycosis, followed by a relatively rare but still uh, conditions which are seen li uh, like leishmaniasis. So starting with the first common condition which all of us encounter is skin tuberculosis, which again has a number of clinical presentations which uh, are sometimes recognizable, but sometimes present in such a way that it necessitates a biopsy for a proper diagnosis. So the commonest condition which we see is lupus vulgaris, which can of course be very typical, but otherwise there is every chance that this condition can also be confused with many other infective conditions, for instance leprosy and also non-infective dermatosis. So that's why I'm picking this as the first subject to start with and let me just go across some of the more chief physiological features of lupus vulgaris. So as we see in this slide, what we see is a piece of tissue which shows us both the epidermis as well as the uh, upper part of the dermis. In the epidermis what we see is some areas which are having a little hyperkeratosis, but otherwise what is striking to the eye is this irregular acanthosis and, uh, and uh, something like inward proliferations of the stratum malperium into the dermis, which in some places is definitely prolonged and club shaped and sometimes these in other cases could assume such proportions which we have in say typical dermis pseudoepithelometer hyperplasia. And in this hyperplastic area, sometimes we uh, sometimes we see keratin uh, pearl-like structures, both as we see here, and also in one part we see there are abscesses, there are small collections of uh, degenerated neutrophils, lymphocytes, and macrophages, which constitute uh, a small abscess, and rest of the area is uh, accompanied by subepidermal infiltrate which is almost coalescing and present in the upper part of the uh, upper part of the uh, dermis which is also called the papillary dermis and in the infiltrate when you go across the infiltrate it's mainly composed of lymphocytes and as we come to this area where uh, we see a tongue of uh, acanthotic proliferation we see this lower part is almost surrounded by lymphocytes and some of the epithelioid cells have also coalesced to form the typical many Langhans giant cells. If one can see that with a ring of nuclei in the, in the, in the periphery 
and we also see that the epidermis is abutting on the basal cell layer and trying to enter the epidermal area. That's how probably the abscess would have been formed because most of the serine fluid is so heavy, it's also encroaching upon the lower part of the epidermis. So, giving all, given all these features, the presence of an epidermal hyperplasia and the presence of a, a granuloma and a coalescing type of infiltrate in the upper dermis, we make a, we, we make a diagnosis of lupus vulgaris. And it may also be important to uh, correlate it with, uh, with the clinical picture provided by the, the dermatologist. And in such patients also, it's, uh, one, may, uh, one may like to know whether uh, we should do a screen for the organism or not. But it's, uh, all these are almost uh, possible conditions where it's very difficult or rather well, if not impossible to demonstrate the acid fast bacilli. So normally a report goes without, the perform without performing these uh, special states unless specifically asked for and the diagnosis would be lupus vulgaris. So I hope you are uh, seeing the first picture. This is a common picture that will be repeated in most of the other types of skin tuberculosis with a little alteration. But the basic finding of a tuberculosis structure, a granuloma composed of epithelial cells and giant cells is fundamental to this type of skin infection. And we'll, there are also other conditions which would mimic, as I said earlier, and we would see the next condition, which is a close mimicker, which is also a close mimicker, but there are still uh, subtle changes which can tell us probably that we are not dealing with skin tuberculosis. Let's enter the spectrum of uh, leprosy. In leprosy also we have a huge spectrum starting from the possible way to the multi by the end. So let us start with the possibility end in which we get some uh, solitary or one of a, a few plaques which could again resemble other conditions which I mentioned, notably when uh, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis infections which we saw earlier. And let us start with tuberculoid leprosy. Yeah, now we are seeing as a piece of skin tissue which shows almost all the features so well. It's almost uh, like a very pattern. It's a, we discuss these in terms of patterns because patterns is what helps us to recognize a disease. It's not the granuloma alone. So we re definitely recognize a certain pattern here which has shortly come into. Again, we see as before, we see the epidermis. Note that the epidermis is usually normal or atrophic in skin tuberculosis. It's never uh, hypertrophic or it does not show a pseudo epidermis hyperplasia as we saw in the previous uh, slide of skin tuberculosis. And then uh, yeah, here we see uh, almost a thinned out epidermis. And what we see, uh, what we see here is uh, the subepidermal zone is a little uh, free of uh, any infiltrate. But what we see in the dermis, which is uh, which is uh, till the subcutis is almost granuloma. But look, in, in the granuloma there is a certain pattern. All these are almost ovoid or curvilinear. Either uh, ovoid in the vertical direction or ovoid in the curvilinear direction, which is, which is very which is, a different, which is a definite pattern for suspecting tuberculosis because we see even in the clinical features that it is these very structures that are also affected. For instance, there will be loss of sensation, there will be loss of sweating. And all these also are because they had, uh, affection of the disease of these appendages and that's, that's what explains the curvilinear pattern of uh, leprosy and in tuberculoid leprosy what is striking is these granulomas are uh, solid, circumscribed and composed both of epithelioid cells, giant cells and lympho uh, and uh, epithelioid cells. Some of these also coalesce to form this Langan's giant cell which we also saw in lupus vulgaris. One important thing is they are also confined by a shell of lymphocytes in the periphery, unlike the naked granulomas which we see in sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis, you see, is just a pure uh, granuloma composed of uh, epithelial cells, which are naked in the sense that they don't have an outer shell or an outer mantle of lymphocytes, which distinguishes them from other conditions. And these structures are visualized in the very uh, advantageous as well as perineural, but sometimes you see in, say, in a given case of uh, tuberculoid leprosy, one may find it difficult to demonstrate the nerves. 
because either the nerves are destroyed beyond recognition or even if they are present, they may be uh, intraneural and they would have destroyed the nerve to such an extent that even recognition becomes rather difficult. So again, just like uh, the possible secondary forms of skin tuberculosis, demonstration of organism with this type of leprosy is particularly very difficult and the diagnosis is usually made based on the clinical features, the pattern of granuloma visualized by the, uh, by, by the pathologist and uh, this conclusion by far is one of the best ways to come to a final diagnosis. So a 5 variable strain for demonstration of microbiome leprosy is generally not necessary in these patients. So after having completed the possibility form of uh, skin tuberculosis, we would also go into the other extreme which is the lepromatous leprosy where vessels are large in number and we'll have a glimpse of what say, a type of granuloma we would be seeing in such conditions. So next I'll, tell, I'll take you to the slide of lepromatous leprosy and what characterizes this disease in contrast to the tuberculoid form of the disease. So in lepromatous leprosy what we see is again you see as a epidermis in leprosy usually remains always thinned out or normal that is never uh, hyperplastic or hypertrophic or shows pseudoepidermis hyperplasia as we saw in the previous conditions and people often describe a Grenz zone which is a subepidermal zone of uh, clearance as we saw in tuberculoid leprosy but this zone is not always constant and may or may not be present in a given case of lepromatous leprosy. If present, it's fine. If not present, it does not rule out the possibility of uh, lepromatous leprosy. And here too, we see an infiltrate, almost dense, occupying the entire uh, dermis in the upper part, the middle and the lower part also. And as we go, uh, as we see, uh, see in the middle, uh, as we see in the middle, this particular collection of cells small round collection of cells in the dermis which shows a large number of macrophages which are if you focus a little more on them most of the macrophages are empty hollowed out and give a foamy appearance just like a soap bubble appearance in described in textbooks and we see that the number of lymphocytes are also reduced Similar appearance is afforded by this, by the next larger collection of cells which also show foamy macrophages in a setting of few lymphocytes and it is these foamy macrophages that give us a clue to the diagnosis of lepromatous leprosy. What we saw before was mainly epithelial cells and giant cells in tuberculoid region whereas here we are seeing the same macrophages which are simply engulfing the bacilli but are not able to destroy them and so they give a foamy appearance. But unfortunately to demonstrate the bacilli we can't see the bacilli in a simple HP section and they would better be seen in a fight farico section, stain section of the same. In a fight farico section strain for mycobacterium leprae, these organisms stand out prominently. You just focus all these are the these were the same cells which we saw as uh, foamy cells occupying the occupying the macrophages, the previous uh, section strain by HND and all these are rod shaped solid organisms lying within the macrophages and we see number of them, some of them lying also in cigar shaped bundles which is said to be a typical feature for lepromatous leprosy and if one takes the uh, Ridley logarithmic scale this would easily amount to 5 to 6 plus which is a diagnostic feature for lepromatous leprosy and this would help us clinch the diagnosis and some of these patients who have taken treatment, the foamy appearance would not be lost, but the presence of these uh, bacilli would give us an indication. In other words, they would not be as solid as this, but they would show a segmented or a fragmented appearance, which indicates that this patient should have taken treatment in the past, or maybe he's on 
treatment elsewhere. With this, we pass on to the other granular metals infections that can give us a similar uh, histopathologic picture plus also confuse us clinically. But these are the two main microbial conditions which we have discussed, which you would encounter in practice. And for the next condition, we would, uh, which I mentioned was also fungal infections, we would uh, go through one of the common uh, deep mycotic infections which all of us encounter in practice and that is actinomycosis. It is actinomycosis. So this, uh, commonly these patients come to, uh, come to the clinician with sinuses. They call it, it's swelling in sinuses and the biopsy is often taken from the uh, in and around the sinus, uh, sinus region from where the fungus gets extruded. And that accounts for the absence of uh, epidermis in this biopsy because this shows the uh, this shows the sinus, and this biopsy shows uh, in, in fact the dermal portion only. We see the almost it has gone into the subcutis level, and we see small rounded collections of uh, separate what we call as a separative granuloma. By a separative granuloma, I mean the same gra granulomatous picture, but we. Uh, if we add the word separation when there is a presence of neutrophils to it, for instance, this is a granuloma which contains not only the epithelial cells and uh, histiocytes which we saw in the previous collection, but we also see neutrophils and neutrophilic debris to a large extent which gives it the name separative granuloma and they are all enclosed by a fibrotic shell. You see fibrosis is a very typical feature of mycotic healing and like that. Continuous healing and fibrosis is the healing is the presence of mycotic skin infections. And what is most important is to look for the presence of organisms within this uh, uh, within this area of separation or within the separative granuloma, which is most one has to search every location and with some difficulty or by cutting even more sections, one can come to a conclusion before giving the final report. In this, we see that. We see the presence of this uh, a, thing, a solitary grain within this. It's a grain within the abscess that is most important, which is composed of a fungi. We see a grain within this abscess. This is a collection of cells. In the inside this is this bluish grain. And if one notes the periphery of the grain shows these uh, pink border pink borders which are all otherwise called a splendor happily phenomenon indicating an antigen antibody reaction to the presence of the fungal grain within the, uh, within the abscess. And as one look uh, sees the inside the border of the abscess, what is seen is the very thin filaments. You see they are all less than two microns in size and these give a clue that this may not be eumycetoma but it's likely to be acromycetoma. I'm saying this because sometimes it's very difficult to get a culture report. We often want a culture to differentiate between eumycetoma and acromycetoma because in eumycetoma one cannot treat the condition whereas acromycosis there is every reason for hope being given to the condition. If you get a culture fine but if we don't get a culture with a reasonable experience, a uh, dermatopathologist would be able to give us the answer to this question that whether we are dealing with an acnomycetoma or a eumycetoma. And eumycetoma is really much more thick, whereas there are thinner filaments in acno acnomycosis. And this is a classical example of those thin filaments. So it's very likely that the patient is having an, uh, as, uh, suffering from acnomycosis. And there is every reason that we should be able to cure this condition. And this is one of the commonest uh, conditions uh, again we see in uh, deep mycosis. So having gone through these common, uh, com com common dermatoses, we will go through the other parasites which are uh, for fungal, uh, parasitic and fungal conditions which are also noted for giving rise to cutaneous granulomas. One of the commonest uh, one of the less common fungal infections, which is also uh, now increasingly being seen, is particularly the advent of AIDS and HIV infection, is histoplasmosis. And histoplasmosis is a dimorphic fungus, which can uh, again give rise to a large number of uh, skin conditions and. Mm -hmm. 
There is an interesting thing about histoplasmosis that it may not be even suspected by the clinician on a, on a simple clinical examination, uh, simple clinical exam of the patient. It may be a pure, a purely a dermatologic suspicion, a dermatopathologic suspicion in these instances. And that's what makes it an interesting disease to us. And as we see here, we see a picture of, uh, of the, of the the epidermis is relatively normal with a little hyperkeratosis at places and we see a dense infiltrate you see occupying the almost the entire dermis and extending by partly into the subcutis tissue in one, in one portion so in the it is in the dermis what we see is that again as we saw in the previous pictures we are seeing a collection of uh, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and a large number of macrophages. It is the, the cytoplasm of these macrophages which we have to look for. And what we see in the cytoplasm of these macrophages is... No, we are seeing now, what we are seeing now is a granuloma. See, this is also a granulomatous condition, but as, uh, as the books would tell you, see, the more granulomatous is the histopathology, the less likely one is fire, likely to find organisms. So this simply shows it's a granulomatous condition. But when we want to find a, 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 the organisms, we should go in the subepidermal layer, which is composed less of epithelial cells, and, uh, but more of simply macrophages and lymphocytes. And it is here that, and it is here that we see a large number of uh, Parasites. You see, uh, you see, in the cytoplasm of the macrophages appearing with a clear halo around them, and they probably measure about three to five microns in uh, diameter. They are, uh, they are seen as blue to magenta colored, uh, to, to blue to purple dots lying within the cytoplasm of the macrophage, lying within the large vacuoles in the macrophages. And these are uh, these would definitely help the, the pathologist to clinch the diagnosis of histoplasmosis and in order to confirm that what we are seeing is histoplasmosis we should do a PA stain which helps us to clench the diagnosis and in a PA stain we will see those organisms as well. pink or magenta colored organism the same location where we saw them I'm coming to that only. So here we see them as pink colored organisms lying within the macrophages. See large number of these cells. large number of these pink to magenta colored organisms. They are basically yeasts. So sometimes you can see them also in their uh, budding forms. And as we see them, they are all occupying the cytoplasmic vacuoles present in the macrophages. And these definitely would agree that they do not resemble uh, Leishman Donovan bodies, which in short have a dot and a dash appearance, indicating an oval nucleus and a paranucleus. So these are definitely indicative of histoplasmosis. So if uh, based on this one can do also for the cultures. So one also sees these yeast like organisms uh, lying within the pseudo capsule. As we go below we can uh, see the pseudo capsule. Unlike cryptococcosis which are marked. Cryptococcosis can also present in a similar way that that's also a yeast. But that's a much larger than histoplasma and that definitely has a mucinous capsule around it. Both these features are lacking and this would help us to come to a conclusion about the diagnosis. And if you want, we can proceed with the cultures also in this particular patient for histoplasma. It will also give us a good clue. And treatment, of course, would be specific for histoplasmosis. And this is, a, this, is, this is an example of, uh, these are all examples of fungal conditions which we may encounter in practice. And among the parasitic conditions, the commonest one which one would like, uh, one is likely to see as a dermatologist would be leishmaniasis. Now leishmaniasis is seen in uh, 
places both the sports scholars at Dermal Leishmaniasis and the Scutaneous Leishmaniasis with a large number of refugees coming from the uh, Midwest, like Yemen, Iraq and others. One can also get Cutaneous Leishmaniasis. But the basic features which we would see in, uh, in Leishmaniasis would be the typical demonstration of the organism which is seen, with, which represents the amyastic forms of the parasite, which is seen as intracytoplasmic bodies which are seen as leachman donovan bodies and what we see here now is a piece of skin tissue again showing the structures the, the, the skin the it shows the epidermis the, the the dermis and the subcutis and what we see is the epidermis is relatively normal except for a some amount of uh, acanthosis in the edges otherwise there is a dense infiltrate occupying the upper half of the upper half of the dermis and a little nodular collection is also in the lower part of the dermis but it is here that's very most important for us as far as leech is concerned and when we see this subepidermal area When we see this marked subepidermal area, what is important to us? What is important to us is the presence of, again, as we saw, if a large number of organisms present within the macrophages of these, cytoplasm of these macrophages, these cells are almost the stru same structure as that of histoplasmosis, except that some of these are also extracellular in location and otherwise they are filling up the uh, cytoplasm of these macrophages and uh, on uh, if we uh, on higher magnification we will be, uh, we'll be able to see them as uh, occupy or the amastroid form will be seen as uh, an eccentric oval nucleus with a rod shaped keratoplast separated by uh, separated by intervening uh, normal space so that that's what gives the dot and a dash appearance which is said to be typical when we do set skin smears so this a similar picture would be seen also in postcal as a dermal uh, postcal as a leash acid lv body is common to both these both these conditions and as the lesions become more chronic and more granular matters it becomes difficult to demonstrate lv bodies and then the diagnosis is more depend upon a strict Dermo clinical pathologic correlation and the geographic area from, uh, from where the patient is coming. This is just a, to, in fact, uh, to give you uh, to give all of your birds a view of the common scale uh, of the common conditions which I have uh, enumerated here. And it's not necessary that all of them should fit into this particular pattern, but these patterns would certainly help us recognize recognize them confidently. It also helps us to differentiate one from the other. I am uh, grateful that you could spare time to listen to this uh, small lecture and if you have certain uh, more queries or any questions or specific questions in, on any particular segment, we would be very happy to receive, your, uh, receive the written questions from any one of you. We would be glad to answer them and I wish you all the best and hope you enjoyed this uh, small session. Thank you.